So, uh, you know, in case you're not familiar with Spelman College, it's a historically black college for women in Atlanta, Georgia. So it's a very kind of unique institution, uh, even among HBCUs in that it is uh, only catering to women. So, and produced a lot of um, black women mathematicians over the years. I think if you really kind of look back, something like a good half of women who have PhD in mathematics come from Spelman College. So. Just wanted to put that back in. Um, so uh, this presentation is going to be largely based on a recent paper that came out uh, in Primus, a, a special issue of Primus in mathematics in the life sciences. Uh, and uh, we're talking in this paper about transdisciplinary modules. And so what's the real big idea behind this? Um, it's the idea that we use uh, real work problems, messy problems that oftentimes might need um, the, the, the input or, or the solutions that come from the different disciplines such as you know, biology, mathematics, computer science, and so on. And these um, two fields, you know, mathematics and computer science, have been really important over the last few years, uh, important components of um, the discipline of biology. And so in these transdisciplinary modules, we're not trying to create modules that are completely self-standing. I mean, they are, but uh, they can be um, can, uh, taken into different courses. So um, we, for example, created a module that we introduce our students to in introductory biology, but that same module can be revisited when they take some of their math courses like calculus. And then that's module can be revisited in their computer science course. And as they move from course to course and revisit the same problem from very different angles with their professors that are either in mathematics or computer science or biology, the emphasis is going to be different. And so the idea is that over the years, they might really have a much deeper understanding of the, the problem and the ways to address and attack this problem. And so, you know, um, earlier we were talking about how biologists are oftentimes scared of mathematics, um, but this approach we hope introduces them to mathematics in a way that's a little less sort of anxiety causing. Uh, it also conveys the interdisciplinary nature of science. Uh, it exposes them to scientific thinking, modeling, problem solving, quantitative reasoning. And also, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the simulations they do. It's really a nice way to, to, to tinker with the material they have and to develop uh, learning independence. And so the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I'm going to talk about the module we developed. It is about EPO, the hormone EPO, and how it helps regulate um, the production of red blood cells in how this module can span three disciplines. And then I'm going to talk about the process of creating this modules and kind of what we can learn from creating this module. And then I have to say that um, we have been um, so good now by now at dealing with these modules that when COVID-19 came around, we quickly put together um, COVID-19 epidemiological, well, it's not specific to COVID-19, but you know, an epidemiological modeling unit um, that also spans several courses, really based almost on the same script and the same, same model. And so uh, the EPO module, um, so um, this module was first in, um, developed for an introductory biology course uh, the, in which I teach along with another five instructors. So we have about 200 students that are subdivided into four or five sections. It's very kind of hands-on student-centered. It's a studio format, so it's not really lecture plus lab, but rather uh, kind of a blend between lecture and lab. It's very active um, learning uh, centered. 
So this course is also called um, Organismal Form and Function. So some of the important topics that are covered are homeostasis uh, and how the body maintains uh, a certain kind of constant environment. Um, in some, uh, and maintenance of homeostasis is oftentimes dependent on feedback loops. And, uh, you know, the classic example is when the temperature goes up, you know, we do a lot of things, our body does a lot of things that brings the temperature back down, or if temperature drops a little too low, then, you know, we shiver and so on and so on to bring temperature back up. We also discuss hormones in this course. Um, and so within the context of the hormone unit, we'll have a general lecture on hormones, and then we introduce this EPO modeling activity. Uh, another important concept uh, in this course is also gas exchange and the importance of red blood cells in carrying oxygen um, and cellular respiration and so on. So we really thought there was an opportunity to introduce here uh, a module on um, um, the regulation of red blood cell production by EPO. So EPO is a hormone that's produced by kidneys. If the oxygen, the blood that comes to the kidneys has as low in oxygen, then the kidneys will produce EPO, which then stimulate um, cells in the bone marrow, stem cells, uh, to produce uh, red blood cells. Uh, and then when there's more red blood cells, then uh, oxygen delivery to tissues is increased. And then we kind of back go back to normal state or baseline. So this is sort of the, the biology, the background, but um, we explained this you know, to students, uh, but we wanna take it a step further uh, using mathematical modeling. So why model uh, so that we can be more quantitative to be able to explain or hypothesize underlying mechanisms to be able to predict physiological parameters or outcomes. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes in uh, introductory biology, when we talk about homeostasis and regulation, we kind of just simply talk in terms of trends that goes up or down and that's it. And here we really want to take it one step further through modeling. And what does it take to model? So we need to understand what factors are involved and how they are related to one another. And so eventually write the equations describing these relationships. Eventually write a script uh, if you want to do simulations. Uh, and then so uh, with the students, we really kind of discuss the you know, uh, item one and two, which is the, what are fa the factors involved and how are they related. Uh, and then we kind of, we don't get them to write the script. Um, we don't overly emphasize the equation. So this is an introductory biology course. And so the emphasis is going to be on the biology side of things. And then where we really get them to think uh, hard in is um, to do the simulations, to think about what parameters or initial conditions they need to change. Um, and then to really reflect uh, on red blood cell homeostasis. So this is the model we introduced them to. Uh, again, um, stem cells are going to produce red blood cells. Uh, and we invite them to think about um, oops, uh, how, you know, at any given point, for example, the amount of red blood cell is going to be dependent on the amount of red blood cells or, or how quickly they get produced. So the rate of production of red blood cells and um, the red rate of death uh, of red blood cells. And we really want them to understand intuitively um, that you know, this pool uh, can either increase or decrease depending on these two rates. And so we ask them to think about um, what if you know, um, production is higher than the death, well then, you know, the amount of red blood cells is going to increase. But if the death is, um, uh, is higher than the production, well then the amount of red blood cells is going to decrease and so on. And we do, we draw sometimes analogies with, for example, a lake. 
you know, if you have a lake and uh, if there's water coming in through either rain or through rivers, from rivers, and there is downstream rivers carrying some of that water away, what happens? And so on, what happens if there's all of a sudden a lot of precipitation, et cetera. So we kind of really get them to understand intuitively um, the relationship between you know, these rates and the amount of red blood cells. And we explain to them that you know, this um, the amount of red blood cells at any given time is going to be essentially uh, a function of the stem cells minus uh, the function of red blood cells uh, and uh, the parameter A1 times stem cell pool. So it's gonna be dependent on the amount of stem cells in that uh, parameter, that rate, uh, minus the rate, rate of death in the spleen uh, times the amount of uh, red blood cells. Um, and then we kind of start to build piece by piece uh, other aspects of uh, the model. And in the end, we get to this. Essentially, uh, red blood cells are going to be carrying oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that's carried is going to be dependent on the red blood cell and uh, this parameter A2. And so B2 uh, relates to oxygen use in tissues. And if the amount of oxygen is low, then EPO production will increase, which in turn is going to affect A1, which is the rate of production of uh, red blood cells from stem cells and so on. So we kind of go over this and we provide the three differential equations um, that relate to this model. And um, I explained to them, you know, that um, these uh, differential. And so some students who've taken already calculus, they're like, oh yeah, these are differential equations. But we explained to them that they'll learn more about functions and differential equations in their math course. Uh, and then, uh, we, so the main thing we insist on is uh, they really need to understand this model, the relationship of all the parameters and the state variables. And then um, once, you know, that was really step one, you know, there's even some uh, homework that they do to really make sure that they understand uh, the biology side of things. Uh, and then we give them a, a Python script. We use uh, this online platform called GlowScript. You just go to glowscript.com and they create their username and password. Typically, actually, their spam and username and password uh, goes uh, you know, gets them in. They don't even have to create username and password. And then we give them the script. They copy paste it and then they just, cl just click Run Program. And this will automatically display this graph, very simple graph. Um, and uh, where uh, in red, we have the red uh, blood cells, in green, the APO, in blue, the oxygen amount. And they plot uh, the numerical solutions uh, over time for each of these uh, state variables. Uh, it's a fairly simple script. We just explain again, you know, we're not going to go in the, in the details of the computer science, but we explain that typically a script um, has, you know, the beginning part is where you define your variables and your initial conditions. Here is your A1, your B1, your A2, B2, A3, B3, and then the stem cell, we start at 1,000, blood cell, we start at 1,000, EPO, we start at 1. O2, we start at one. This is just the display. And these are just the numerically solving these um, three differential equations and um, for each time point. And that's it. Uh, so we just kind of briefly go over it. Again, we're not going to hold them accountable uh, for the mathematical aspects nor the, um, the code that is going to be part of this unit, but we just want them to be exposed and be aware of it. And then we give them uh, these different scenarios. So for example, today Jasmine saw the American Red Cross van on campus and went into the need blood. She gave about one liter of blood. 
And so they need to find out, you know, in this scenario, when you donate blood, what happens? Uh, what are the parameters that you need to change here? So blood, when you get blood, we're talking about the pool of red blood cells. And so all of a sudden, the initial starting condition of the red blood cell then needs to be edited on the script. And so they go to the script and they edit, edit RBC from a thousand, let's say, to start off with 900. And what would be the output? They just hit run and they get, you know, for all of these different scenarios, they get these outputs. So blood donation. So this one, for example, is blood donation where they start for red blood cells at 800 which then you know, decreases, drops uh, the amount of oxygen uh, that is available to the tissues. And then that boosts the amount of uh, EPO that gets produced until eventually there is enough red blood cell production and we're back to uh, uh, the initial starting point, the original starting point of 1000. So this is a scenario where there's blood transfusion instead of blood donation. So again, it's the initial amount of red blood cells that need to be tweaked. This is a situation with anemia. So anemia is a situation where this particular case is low due to anemia due to low iron. Uh, so um, the amount of, um, there's EPO that's being produced, but um, there, the, person is unable to actually produce uh, red blood cells, despite the fact that EPO levels are high because iron is a component of red blood cells and is not available and so on. And then this one was EPO do do doping. Uh, so injection of EPO and what, it, what effect it has on uh, red blood cell production. Uh, and so we discussed these scenarios uh, oftentimes they're really thrilled that, you know, just tweak something and then, wow, you know, they have an output. And then we discuss uh, what it means, you know, uh, for example, in this scenario, in this scenario, we kind of went back to the original state. Um, whereas in these two conditions, you know, this condition, in this particular condition, we never go back to the original state. In this one, we also do. But there are scenar some scenarios where they don't go. And then we realized that actually, when you don't go back to the initial levels, um, that means you are at a disease state. So it kind of makes sense, but <laughs> uh, in a disease state being you know, an abnormal condition. But we really saw that from the output of these graphs. Uh, and so um, that was the module we developed for um, the introductory biology course. And what I wanted to show here is how some of these real world problems, in this case, the production of red blood cells regulated by the hormone EPO is a problem that can be visited from many different angles. So in biology, uh, in math and computer science. So um, the math course uh, emphasizes more you know, uh, aspects such as ordinary differential equations, approximations, fixed points, and it all depends whether these are intro level courses or upper level courses, but one can really um, adjust and based on the concepts that they're teaching in that particular math course. Uh, and then in computer science, for example, um, this was reused to reinforce concepts about loops, um, functions and subroutines, the integration of ODEs, the Euler method for solving uh, differential equations, uh, root finding for fixed points, parameter estimation, linearization, and so on and so on. So, Depending on the class where this unit is used, um, there are many different uh, aspects that can be emphasized. Okay, um, now moving on to the process. Um, and so this was a collaboration across departments at Spelman College, as well as uh, with a collaborator at Georgia Tech, so across institutions. Um, for me, the goal of the activity was to really uh, sell to the students that modeling is a valuable tool and skill for a biologist. And um, 
that they can use this mathematical model to answer biological questions. And it was very important that they understand the model, they connect with the model uh, to be able to predict outcomes when the system is perturbed, be able to modify the script according to different scenarios. So that was one of the aspects that was very important for me. Uh, and then uh, uh, along the way is just make them aware that you know, um, mathematical equations and coding are also important components uh, for biology education. Um, so that eventually they pay a little bit more attention to their you know, uh, computer courses and math courses. Uh, to design this, it, um, it required us to first sort of identify gaps and opportunities opportunities, where could we possibly introduce modeling activities. I was teaching Bio 115 and, you know, I felt like, you know, this is an organismal form and function, organismal biology based course, but, you know, feedback from your stasis hormones can, can be a good place for it. Uh, and so we developed this hands-on activity. Uh, there were some choices that had to be made along the way. So we decided to use Python rather than MATLAB, for example, partly because the person who helped us develop it was more at ease with Python than MATLAB. Uh, we also really wanted to make sure that students were not doing modeling for the sake of modeling, but rather because it was going to solve a, a question or a problem. Um, they really needed to see the, the usefulness of it. The activity needed to be fail safe, uh, not necessarily perfect. Uh, you know, there were a few scenarios where it didn't quite work for some reason, um, but we wanted it to be very easy to implement in an introductory biology setting where you have, you know, multiple sections uh, with a total of 200 students. Um, and that's why you know, instead of having students to download and install some software, we thought that using a an online platform like GlowScript uh, was really ideal. And, and so we just checked if everything worked and, and we could implement it fairly easily. Um, how did we go about creating these modules? So it started off with, you know, uh, my research in plant biology and my uh, ongoing co conversations with Eva Hartford at Georgia Tech, who is a, a modeler. Uh, and so he said, well, why don't you create, uh, why don't we create um, something that could be introduced in introductory biology? And so he provided some, uh, some material PowerPoints code with the Anaconda platform. And when I saw that, I said, oh no, this Anaconda with these knobs that you just moved, no, they're not seeing the script. We, we want them to see the script. And that's the main point. And we don't want to hide it from them. We actually want to empower them to be able to, to tweak it. Um, and then that PowerPoint and the material was actually heavily, heavily uh, math-based. And I felt like I love math, but I know that this is not going to do it for our students. And we know our students. And said so Spam and myself and Derek Hilton, who's in the physics department, with whom we all, we've also been working on similar projects, you know, between mathematics and physics, uh, and between biology and physics, uh, we knew what we were talking about. And so we kind of quickly put together the whole module that included a pre-class assignment. We had this worksheet with the different scenarios I had shown you earlier, some questions, instructions. We completely revised that PowerPoint, rewrote the code for Grow Script. It's a code that students can, can see. Um, we had to package it with all the learning objectives, draft exam questions, and so on. And then uh, we took it to all the instructors in the biology, the introductory biology course. Uh, and we kind of revisited and tweaked it with them. And, and actually, that was one of those moments where we felt like, hmm, you know, they, a lot of them were like uncomfortable, uneasy, and uh, which is very common, you know, for um, any instructor for that matter to, to feel a little bit, you know, 
uneasy with something that another person has developed and we're not involved in co-developing it. So if there was anything I would have done a little differently, it would have been to involve them a little bit um, ahead in the process. Uh, it's kind of at the right balance. You know, when it's just two people um, on the same page, it can move very quickly. But when you have more people involved, you know, and there's going to be a lot more negotiations uh, uh, happen. So things might move a little slowly. But anyways, you know, eventually they, they felt comfortable. Uh, we've done more tweaking to a point where they felt comfortable. But again, here, the, the most important point is that they don't need to feel like they have to um, deliver the mathematics or the computer science course or units. They don't need to be overly knowledgeable, um, but that they just use it. Um, and the emphasis again in their expertise is the biology side of things. And then eventually, once we got that going in intrabiology, uh, we started reaching out to colleagues in mathematics and computer science. And actually, that part was rather easy. <laughs> so the activity, again, evolved from an emphasis on differential equations, where we left out some slides and exam questions that were really on differential equations to moving more towards understanding how the model captures the biology uh, with exam questions, with scenarios where students predict the outcome and change variables or initial conditions. Okay, so part three now is, um, oh, part three should have been kind of how we um, extended this uh, very recently, last semester, we kind of repackaged again um, the module to now make it an epidemiological modeling uh, unit. Um, and um, when COVID hit uh, last semester, all of us were teaching online, but you know, we decided that we were going to form a little uh, working group uh, and involved other people as well, a working group on COVID-19, just to kind of share resources and possibly um, build uh, cross-departmental uh, modules. And um, we came up with this modeling unit. So with my colleague, Dr. Jelks in environmental and health science and my colleague in mathematics, Dr. Iboy, he was actually a brand new professor last spring uh, who just joined um, the mathematics department of Spelman. But when I knew that a modeler, a modeler was coming in that department, it's a department that's pretty um, pure math, but uh, he's one, you know, they're starting to get more and more into uh, applied math. And so he's probably one of their first applied mathematicians. And they're probably gonna hire another one again. Um, and so how did we package it? Uh, we had a unit uh, for first year students. So these first year colloquia at Spelman, you know, in some campuses, they might be called freshman seminars. Uh, and um, they're just one credit um, um, kind of uh, on the spur of the moment type of topics in uh, given that COVID was um, devastating the US. Uh, we decided that, um, you know, three of us independently decided that we're going to offer these first year colloquia, so one credit hour courses on COVID. And for me, obviously, it's the mathematical modeling that was a draw, as I mentioned earlier. I'm a plant biologist, um, but uh, uh, with a lot of love for modeling. So um, three of us started to um, develop the, these first year colloquia with uh, very different flavors. Uh, mine was modeling driven, the other one was driven uh, around health disparities, and the other one was um, interested in vaccine development. So, anyways, uh, we kind of shared um, some of the resources for the first year colloquia. So, uh, we had one class period where we introduced them to the SR, the standard epidemiological modeling. Um, the model that dates back from the 1920s. And then uh, we had these hands-on simulation scenarios. So the scenarios here were um, there are 600 first-year students uh, that are on campus. One happens to be uh, infected, what happens? And so they generate some of these curves. 
uh, and, or, you know, if there's 10 of them, then, you know, we also have a similar curve that happens, for instance, course a little earlier, or at what point are we going to exceed the capacity of the college to quarantine students, knowing that there is 50 beds reserved for quarantine students and so on. What happens if students are wearing masks, not wearing masks? Um, what happens if there's a um, strain of a virus that is more transmissible and so on and so on. So we were even anticipating what was going to happen now with the UK variant. Uh, and we also have some collaborations and partnerships with the Broad. So we brought in Dr. Daniel Park, who is a um, viral epidemiologist to give a talk and he kind of explained how they track um, viruses uh, based on some of the mutations. We're actually planning to bring him back again and probably discuss uh, some of what's happening with these, you know, UK strains and South African strains and so on. And then we did uh, real world modeling. So the SR is the very basic model. We also discussed the limitations of models. And then uh, read, um, read a nature paper uh, on epidemiological modeling in the municipality of Fo uh, in Italy. It was one of the places that was hit um, very early on back in February. I think that was where they had the first death of COVID in Italy. And, um, and so, you know, we had figured out the SRI model and then their model splits a little bit asymptomatic versus um, symptomatic people. They did not know at that time how transmissible the disease might be by asymptomatic people and so on. So they tweaked the model. And uh, the interesting thing is, and um, if you go here, um, the colleague, the math colleague, Dr. Ibori had uh, also was teaching in, in this upper level mathematics course. It's kind of a research based, it's the mathematics seminar course. And he also kind of tweaked, if you will, so this is his SR, you know, his derivative of the SRR model, where he separates uh, between those who follow the instructions, the public health uh, standards, you know, wearing masks and so on, washing hands, um, social distancing, et cetera, and those who don't. Uh, and so it was kind of interesting that he, in, in his course, actually ended up uh, studying how public health uh, education can impact the epidemic. And they actually, with his students, so him and all his students in that class, uh, eventually submitted a paper which is now available on Med um, Archives. Um, yeah, so it, it was really, you know, when it, it was doomsday back in, back in the fall, or so we thought, but uh, as, a, as an educator, it was really uh, wonderful. Uh, and then I'll just kind of close with this, which is the fact that we also had a lot of events and speakers around this team. And so not only did we pull on sort of the mathematics, computer science, and bio, a little bit of biology, public health, but we've been able to also connect this topic to of the human and the social side of things uh, and so I was in conversation with a colleague from English department who has a background in philosophy and so there was a conversation uh, with her with Dr. Hitt and uh, grappling with history understanding the times. We started off the conversation on Oedipus Rex uh, by Sophocles and um, in that uh, theater piece the backdrop were actually so sort of the main part of the story is that there is this epidemic that is running its course. And so trying to figure out exactly why and how, and you know, it was interesting to connect it with our time. And we were also wondering why and how this was happening in the United States. So we really had the opportunity to touch on the human and social side of the, uh, the epidemic. We also had, um, this is Meta Corbett, Dr. Corbett, who's kind of really one of the researchers behind the Moderna vaccine, uh, also come and uh, talk, uh, give a talk. And then a former student who is working on her PhD at Emory, but also is employed at the CDC. So she's kind of aware of all the conversations that are taking place there. And it was really nice to have her as a guest uh, several times during uh, this class. Um, 
And with that, I think I'll uh, wrap it up by acknowledging uh, the many people involved in developing these modules, especially the EPM module. Uh, collaborator is the hat for us, Georgia Tech. Uh, Dr. Hongqin Spumman, who got us started in this direction and connected us. Dr. Hilton at Spumman in the physics department. And then these are my colleagues in the introductory biology class. Um, Dr. Tatisha Sistrunk and James Melton are the ones who offered an upper level bioinformatic course where uh, they really looked at the computational side of the module, and Kendra Johnson in mathematics, uh, who really brainstormed with us in seeing how this module could fit in, um, in the math course. So with that, I'll end it and I'll be happy to take questions. I hope I didn't go too much over time. Does anyone have any any questions for our presenter? I, I have a question. Um, in the uh, in the differential equation um, model, you have these parameters like a one and b one. Uh, do you discuss with your class how these things are actually the values of these parameters? So when we give them the script, uh, these are just arbitrary values. It's one, I think we have for most of these parameters, um, but um, they tweak them. So for example, A1 is the rate at which um, red black cells are produced from uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And, you know, okay, let's see if we can put 0 0.9 or 0, 0 0.8, but, Point eight for these um, parameters, and let's see what's the outcome. And of course, you know they are meant to really capture something in biology, which is that uh, you know it's the rate of production of um, red blood cells, and you can dial it down, especially if there's a problem like um, iron deficiency-related uh, anemia. So if the body's unable to produce red blood cells for some reason, then that's the parameter you need to, to tweak. So I really you know, wanted to project the biology on all of these parameters. Yeah, like if, for example, for like qualitative um, results, sometimes it doesn't really matter so much what the parameters are, just like their, their ratios or something like that. Whereas if you're trying to predict something, then sometimes you really need to know the actual values of the parameters. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so one of the things we do at the end is to critique this model, right? It's not the perfect end all model, it has many gaps. So to begin with, you know, um, EP, um, red blood cells don't get produced for another, you know, in reality for it takes two, three days before you start to really produce uh, red blood cells. So the model doesn't take that into account. Um, so it's a long term or, you know, at least a few days response. But if you are body experiences low oxygen, the first thing you do is to breathe harder and faster. <laughs> uh, so not to produce, <laughs> to, to produce more red blood cells. So we kind of, you know, we critique the, um, we critique the, the approach. Uh, and actually in the upper level course, what they do is they correct for that. So they introduce a breathing rate uh, parameter in there. Um, the days, you know, a lot of the values, so they need to do parameter estimation to be able to get the correct values for all of those parameters. So it's still quite qualitative, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Anne, did you have a question? Oh, I, you go ahead. I, I did, and I'm, a, I'm a, also a biologist, and so I was just really excited to see that you are doing these things. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you scaffold some of these modeling skills throughout your biology curriculum? Um, so it, you, you clearly are starting with some, and then how do, how do they build? Yeah, so, and so for these modeling units, so they start them off in biology, in introductory biology, and then they can take it to calculus class. Um, okay. You know, so it doesn't always happen in a very predictable or linear way. So um, in the sense, you know, we can't say, okay, first year, first semester, you take this course and then uh, second semester this, we can't really prescribe it. That may happen, it may not happen. Just in that sense, these are self-standing modules, right? We can't force the students to take them. And then some students, they have not taken their um, uh, 
their calculus by the time they come to biology. So we can't really expect them to wonder, fully grasp it. Uh, and we're not ready to spend the time. We're biologists, you know, that's, that's <laughs> for them to as content they'll get in, in mathematics. Uh, and so we can't be 100% sure that every student will take all of these courses and when they will take it. And so for that reason, we make sure it's just self-standing. You know, if they never even get the other part, you know, they still get this part. But um, so having said that, um, typically though, they'll get exposed to this module in intro biology and then in calculus and then in an upper level elective. So that's an elective, some may take it or may not take it. Um, yeah. so, and then of course, the, the other piece for me, you know, if they have that, that's plenty for me from, uh, you know, kind of looking at the students who come into my research-based courses where I use modeling to uh, study antibiotic resistance in plants and really understand the relationship between metal uptake and uh, antibiotics. Uh, if they get exposed a little bit, I'm happy. If they have nothing, I'll work with them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But if they have a little bit of prior exposure, it's, uh, it's great. Great. I guess I'll follow up. Do you find that once students have seen kind of the fun or the power of modeling, do they end up picking either more math or seeking your research or, uh, or do they kind of go, oh, I don't want to see that again? <laughs> Um, the way we expose them in this class, they don't even realize they, they're, do, they're being exposed to math or computer science so much. They come out of it feeling more so they need to have a good understanding and conceptualizing of biological problems because the emphasis on, of this module is really mapping the biology. And you know, initially, for me, you know, I. I used to think it was easy and straightforward, but I realized it's actually something very difficult. It's a big intellectual leap to get there. Because uh, they have to organize students, especially, themselves. yeah, okay. first year students. Yeah. So, um, so um, they uh, they also feel a little bit empowered about you know coding because they tweak that code to change the parameters a little bit and they hit the run and the outcome is completely different every time they do it. Uh, and so I think it takes the edge off of um, programming. Great. So it's part of yeah, the strategy there is to introduce them to these courses without feeling like, oh, I need to master it or, you know, mm -hmm. just to build some comfort level with these disciplines more so than really holding them accountable for the content there. Yeah, yeah, good. That sounds like much of what we're trying to do, but always, always looking for new ideas. So thank you. This is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fun and it's been fun working with colleagues from other departments. So. <laughs> right, right. So, well, that's been exactly my my situation and it uh, it takes time though. I think everybody has to realize you're talking sometimes across each other <laughs> and using terms, but it's really mm -hmm. fun once once you get going. Yeah, 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 great. Does, does anybody else have any questions? And do you have another question? Uh, I'm just trying to think if I do. I, unfortunately, I missed the very beginning of your talk. So I, I want to go back and look. Um, I'm really excited about the red cell story. I'll just mm -hmm. say that, so, but I didn't, I missed that part. So what's your area? I think I, Briefly dropped into your talk. It was a cancer. Uh, well, that's not my scientific area, but that is that is a model that I developed with Becky Samp. So I'm I'm a physiologist. I teach animal physiology, cell and cell biology courses primarily as my bread and butter courses, and then I do teach co-teach a mathematical modeling class for sophomores. It's a sophomore level class with a math professor. We teach it with a lab, so we collect data. That's the, the basis of it. Um, but I, 
one of the, I was, but right before this meeting, I was at a biology department meeting where we were talking about scaffolding quantitative skills in our curriculum and the scenario you described is exactly our big problem, along with the training of our faculty. You know, not everyone is comfortable doing that. And I think one of the first steps is one that you mentioned, and that is taking a biological problem and systematically, you know, what are the parts? How do the parts interact? Uh, you know, and dr even just drawing the model. So you dropped in on the cancer model, drawing that model is one of the first steps in developing um, any code. And even if, if that's all you can do, like in an intro bio class, we think that's a really, really important step. Um, and we hope what we're trying to do is then put numbers on that and play with sliders and do the kinds of things it sounds like you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is yeah, a, a great way to sort of scaffold it and emphasize on different aspects every time you revisit a familiar problem. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I mean, COVID has been also a great teaching moment. <laughs> it's, it's been amazing. For epidemiological modeling. I know that there were a few talks about you know, epidemiological modeling. Yeah, and I yeah, see we the just posters too. There's some really good posters that students have done. So. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Yeah, and uh, you know, so with this first year course, the freshman seminar, it's not even taken by exclusively STEM majors. We have all sorts of majors. Uh, and so we can't get too, too deep in the, <laughs> in the weeds with the science. Um, and we have to really package it, you know, with um, so there's going to be the modeling and it has to be very accessible. And I have to say, for example, uh, our speaker from the road, Daniel Park, he did a fantastic job explaining um, the how you track viruses and how you know every time they replicate it, there might be or they get transmitted, there might be um, a mutation that gets picked up and so on. And you know, so it's the phylogeny of, uh, of viruses. Um, we have you know these wonderful raw models is also really part of the the package. You know, bringing in Kismet and Kat Corbett, bringing in a uh, recent alumni who are all, who are also working in this space. Uh, it, it's, it, was a, it was one of my best semesters ever. <laughs> so not only did I teach that in a COVID class, but I also taught a, uh, an upper level methods in molecular biology class where we have kind of weaved in a little bit mm -hmm. of COVID more kind of more the molecular biology side, you know, more genome sequencing and so on, how to sort out, you know, how do you sequence and assemble genomes and mixed in with human uh, RNA and so on? So, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was one of my best semesters, even though it was online. And I was a little bit nervous at the beginning. Oh, how's it gonna be like to teach online? New courses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I I agree. But yeah, COVID has given us a lot of a lot of fodder at all all levels. I think. Um, of teaching and it's, and also, as you say, this non-majors, the non-STEM majors realizing, I mean, they're curious. And of course, mm -hmm. one of our jobs is to be able to articulate science to anybody. And so helping our students do that as well, I think is also important. So I agree, it's good. And what I can say is that I haven't seen any student who is kind of overwhelmed or phased out by it. And yeah, I, I don't want them to react like that, right? But I'm always kind of looking for, it might indicate that. I want to make sure they're just comfortable as second nature to kind of manipulate these scripts and think about these equations without even thinking that you know, they're doing math or. <laughs> right, no, I agree. I, I, when I was thinking about expanding it, across the faculty, I think it's the faculty who are more nervous than the students. You know, I right. think as faculty, if we're doing something new, 
we tend to be like, oh, we're supposed to be the experts. And, yeah. and so I think that's a, the piece that I, I, I feel like is the big lump in our sort of- experience. And one way to sort of overcome that is to have, uh, you know, so our colleague from physics who also wrote the code initially, he would come and just kind of be around. And these are very small-ish, you know, studio format classes. So they're very, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel like the, somebody is watching, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he'll jump in whenever it, it's very fluid. It's, um, uh, it's very sort of a natural learning environment. It's not feel staged in any way. So, uh, when, when you teach this about how many students are in your class? Uh, in this intro course, um, there is about 200 students uh, across about four or five sections. So, but technically, uh, I only have 24 students in my class, okay. even though it's intro biology, you know. So we're a small liberal arts college, and the total student population is about 2,000 at Spelman. Mm -hmm. um, but still, um, yeah, we, you know, by week two, three, I know all my students by name and call on them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fairly intimate, fairly involved. Um, and that helps too, yeah. Do you get um, positive feedback from the students that they, they like sort of like looking at this, this in so much depth? Or do you sometimes get the feeling that they would rather you just sort of, I don't know, teach just sort of like the regular textbook stuff? Um, we don't let them just <laughs> not have them. That's not part of the conversation. Is this one? <laughs> we just known from the beginning that this is very uh, active learning centered, and so we deviate a lot from the textbook, and not just in this particular uh, case. Um, they, but you know, there are some things that are more challenging than others. This is one of the challenging units, actually. But there's another unit that we have also co-developed physics. One deals with um, the flow of blood. So it's fluid dynamics, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then another one is more based on electricity concepts and neurons. Um, and so kind of really understanding concepts of uh, equilibrium potential and so on. And those are fairly, so that is actually one of the hardest units. The neuro unit where they do, they, we, we have, we diagram an electrical circuit and um, they have to open or close some channels uh, and, and how they actually manually generate an um, action potential. And so they have to have very coordinated um, opening and closing of channels uh, to, to generate that. So that one is probably the hardest uh, unit. And then this might be the second hardest. So it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, so the fluid dynamics, for example, is much easier because, you know, they can relate to tubes. So they flush water, you know, pink water through tubes that are either uh, wider or narrower. And so they get introduced to the concept of pressure, um, flow. Um, you know, sometimes we uh, flush instead of water, something very viscous to indicate that blood can actually be more viscous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we simulate um, a constriction or like um, a clot caught in, in a blood vessel and so on. So, and all of this, of course, relate to biological scenarios of clot, um, um, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, etc. So. So some of those units are much easier uh, or a little easier. And over time, we make them also, a little, you know, if there's too much resistance the first time around, we kind of tweak it again so that it feels a little bit more intuitive. It feels a little bit easier, but we don't want to completely <laughs> make it too easy. You know, we kind of stand our ground when it comes to certain concepts and ideas. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so the challenge sometimes is to make sure that everyone in these intro courses is on the same page. Uh, one of our, one of the ways in which we've been operating is that we all had the same exam across the different sections. 
Yeah. So in other words, that means everybody needs to be on the same page and feel comfortable words, with that material. So you're teaching like, um, this, I guess, Introduction to Biology. Is that the name of the class? So you have yeah. a lot of different uh, professors teaching that course or a number of different professors teaching intro bi Introduction to Biology. And you have sort of a common section, uh, sort of a common final exam to sort of keep everyone on the same page so that, that at least you should cover this, and at least you should cover that. But then you can each go off and sort of specialize in the sort of the aspects that you think is sort of most important for like, or you're most interested in or most competent in, sort of like that. Yeah, so we have also a common uh, course page. So same PowerPoints and so on. Okay. All our students have access to the same material. So it's really just the delivery that's a little different. So but so you know, the learning objectives. So everyone is doing the EPO mathematical modeling example. Yeah. Wow, that's like very uniform. So, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. No. Not just me, well, everybody all right. across four or five sections. Yeah. Wow. Is that is that how it's like at Spelman or in general? Like it's sort of very like sort of rigid like that? Where you, you where everyone has to kind of do the same thing to a certain extent? Uh, it's been sort of a habit in this course to do the same thing. Um, and then just to, to make sure that uh, all our students are on the same page. Yeah. Right. I know in many institutions, that's not the case. In the same intro course, you know, mm -hmm. same course designation can be taught by different people with different, you know, slightly different material. Yeah. You know, no matter what style, yeah, no matter what style or, or philosophy you uh, bring to it, there's always good points and bad points to it. So it's, so it's, yeah. You know, it's, there's no sort of like perfect um, utopian uh, way of doing things. Yeah, so it's not so much that spam forces us, you know, it's as we agreed to it. Okay. Right? I mean, it would be against academic freedom to, right. to force people to teach all the same thing. But we have agreed to it and we are, you know, it's been by now it's become almost an institution because that's how we've been doing it for a long time. But it's not really, we don't feel forced. Uh, uh -huh. And some of the faculty members, especially, you know, when uh, if there are any adjuncts and so on who might not be there for the long haul, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's good to, to really do it that way. Mm -hmm. It works better for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, they, if the students felt like, oh, this course taught by so-and-so has this more material or this, uh, we would open up the door for other things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right. Dan, do you have anything else to add? Do you have like so many interesting comments and ideas? Uh, yes and no. I, I was going to say it's certainly for our intro, actually for all of our required courses. So we have an odd sort of intro course and a cell course and a genetics course. We coordinate the labs, mm -hmm. but we don't coordinate the lectures. Uh -huh. We have common learning outcomes. So we spend a lot of time agreeing on what the learning outcomes are, um, but, the, but the actual method by which they are accomplished uh -huh. is very much instructor specific. Uh -huh. um, but the labs are common. So there's, it, it, it works out, I think. Uh -huh. um, and I have to totally agree, once you get to the neuron, <laughs> and do electrophysiology it <laughs> off for biology students it is so abstract mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this semester i'm teaching a, a a course that's the end of a sequence we have an introductory chemistry biology course mm -hmm. so they start very chemical and then they become more biological so i teach the cell biology the end 